Welcome to Slugs and Steins. As a UC Santa Cruz alumni council member, I'd like to welcome you to our monthly speaker series. I'm David Hansen. For those who are new, our Slugs and Steins series engages a UC Santa Cruz faculty member in a discussion with you, the local community of the Silicon Valley and our extended community online with the goal of making us all Renaissance people. We want it to feel like you're just at UC Santa Cruz sitting in class, but with drinks and without tests. Well, we won't threaten you with finals tonight. Dr. Patton's students faced them yesterday evening. Thus the move of this session from Monday to Tuesday. Thank you for switching routines this month. Mike, another volunteer organizer, is with me tonight. We're both alumni and spend our days in entrepreneurial companies, Silicon Valley style. He'll be helping me with the Q&A, and you'll hear from more, more from him at the end. Before we get started, and since we can't see you, we'd like to know where you're zooming in from and how many people you're watching with. The poll has popped up, please answer it. and We'll share the results after we've given everyone a moment to respond. Pretty soon here, you should be able to see the results of the poll. And who is in the virtual room with you? There we go. We'll be tipping our steins this evening with Dr. Benedict Patton, Associate Professor in the Department of Molecular Engineering at University of California, Santa Cruz. He also directs the Computational Genomics Lab at UCSC, which focuses on creating algorithms, software, and services addressing biomolecular challenges. Dr. Patton holds a PhD from the University of Cambridge and the European Molecular Biology Laboratory, both in computational biology. If you have Questions for our professors, please type them in the Zoom Q&A box. We'll address questions mostly at the end of the talk. Don't wait till the last minute, type them in at any time. And if you see somebody else's question that you like, you can upvote it and we'll ask it sooner. Also, if you have a question that best would be addressed right away, for example, if further explanations would help both you and others follow the talk better, you can lead your question with, please ask now, and we'll try to squeeze it in early. This talk is being recorded. In a few days, you'll be able to find it on the UC Santa Cruz Arts and Lectures YouTube channel. We'll post the link in our social media channels and follow up emails. Okay, does everybody have their Stein? Great, I've got your slug, Dr. Patton. All right, thank you. Um, let me just do the honors and share the screen. Thank you for that kind introduction. All right, let's do this. Okay, um, yeah, so thank you. Uh, thanks for giving me the chance to talk to you all this evening. Um, so I gave a, I used a very, very general um, title for my talk, because honestly, I wasn't quite sure what I was going to talk about. Um, and as I kind of got down to it, I thought that actually the best thing I could do was probably take you through some, some things, some of the things you may probably know well, uh, and other things you probably don't, right? So I want to start at the very beginning and tell you a little bit about your genome, and then I'm going to walk from there on uh, through a whole bunch of, I hope, um, interesting topics, which will illuminate some of the things that we do um, at UC Santa Cruz. So, okay, so the human genome. 
Um, we each um, have a unique genome with the uh, exception of identical twins. And you know, our genome and the environment that we you know, grow up in defines us. 50% of our genome comes um, down the maternal line and 50% of the genome comes down the paternal line, comes from, comes from your father. Our genome is composed of 23 pairs of chromosomes. Hold on, let's put it the screen here. Um, we have 22 pairs of autosomes. So those are, are the same um, between the sexes. And then one pair of sex chromosomes that uh, principally defines biological sex. And we get one of each of those, uh, one of each chromosomes from, uh, of the pair from each parent. So our genome is principally composed of this molecule DNA. And DNA has four bases, adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine, uh, a, which we abbreviate you know, in my world to ATCG. Um, each DNA molecule is a double helix, famously the double helix. Um, and so it has two strands um, with the bases paired either A to T or G to C. And so as a result, each strand is actually the mirror of the other. And our genome is vast. It's really, really difficult to put these kind of numbers into perspective, but um, our genome is 6 billion bases long. We get 3 billion bases of that genome from each of our parents. If I were to stretch it out, um, it would be about two meters in length end to end, if I sort of organize them um, end to end. Um, and yet incredibly, incredibly thin. So nanometers, uh, or fractions of a nanometer thick. And here you see in this picture over on the left, um, you can see the DNA representation that um, in my lab we deal with every day, which is essentially this sequence of these four characters, A, T, C, G. And you can see that mirror strand that, uh, uh, that is the complement of the other the, on the double helix. So most of the cell types in your body have a complete copy of your whole genome in their nucleus. So the nucleus um, is about 10 microns, oops, 10 microns across. Um, and yet it contains that complete copy, that 6 billion bases of DNA um, that, 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 that comprises your genome. Um, all told, you have about 3 trillion such cells, so cells with a nucleus in your body. Uh, if you multiply the number of cells by the length of your genome, you come out with an astronomical 18 sextillion, which is 1.8 times 10 to the 22 total bases of DNA. That is an unimaginable amount of DNA that is in each and every one of us. If I were to stretch that out end to end, so each copy end to end across every single cell, um, it would be 6.1 billion kilometers long. So 0.34 nanometers across and 6 billion kil kilometers long. To put that into perspective, not that we can think about it, um, in astronomical terms, that's 20 times the sun and back in each and every single one of us. Um, if you think of it, not in terms of length, but just in terms of data, um, you know, we humans now generate a lot of digital data. Um, there were apparently, according to the IDC, about 64 sectillion bytes generated in 2020, I'm told, um, which is approximately 14 humans worth of DNA. So our information content, our data content is enormous. So um, why am I talking to, to you today? One of the reasons I'm talking to you today is because genome sequencing technology, our ability to read genomes is, uh, is increasing exponentially. Many people I'm guessing, you know, uh, given out where, where we are, will know about Moore's law. So this idea that transistor density uh, doubles every uh, 18 or so months. Well, in 2000, 2001, it cost about $3 billion to sequence the first human genome. It took an act of Congress, Bill Clinton was involved. Um, this was an international project involving thousands of scientists, including scientists at UCC, as I'll get to uh, towards the end of my talk. Um, and it cost, yeah, three, 3 billion. But in the last 20 years, this is a plot I got from, uh, from NHGRI, the National Human Genome Research Institute. In the last 20 years, um, that cost has been reduced by roughly five orders of magnitude, that's this green curve here, from, uh, you know, at the, at the time in 2001, if we'd started the project then, uh, you know, roughly $300 million down to, to, to uh, thousands uh, today. If you compare that increase in uh, performance improvement versus Moore's law, DNA technology is improving much, much more quickly. Um, in the same time period, 
uh, transistor densities, so over those last 20 years, transit, transistor densities have only improved by about 100 times less uh, than our improvements in our ability to read DNA. So how do we read DNA? How does the, how does the technology work? Well, um, this is obviously a simplification, but basically um, at the beginning, we take a biosample. So this could be a blood sample or a saliva sample or some other uh, bodily tissue sample, uh, could be a biopsy. Um, and we prepare it using uh, you know, a library preparation. This is a, essentially a chemical treatment of the DNA to extract it from the cells and, and, uh, and break it into pieces that we can put into our sequencing machine. And then we pass that, the, the, essentially the purified DNA into a sequencing machine, like the one I'm showing you here. Um, and out the other end are little digital, so snippets of DNA. We call these reads. So each read is like a little tiny jigsaw piece, is the way I think about it, um, of DNA. Uh, uh, essentially a read, a, a molecule that represent, uh, represented as a string of A, C, T's and G's. So the first problem I want to talk to you uh, today is this problem of de novo assembly. So de novo assembly is probably the hardest problem um, in, in primary genomics. And what it is essentially is you're given your genome, but not obviously the whole genome, you're given those little reads, those individual jigsaw pieces. And the job is essentially to put the jigsaw puzzle together. It's that simple. You've got the pieces, you try to piece them together, and at the end, you know, hopefully you get something that's close to a final picture. Of course, DNA is not two dimensional like a you know, jigsaw, uh, DNA is one dimensional. So the way to think about this is that, you know, if, if, our, if the puzzle we're trying to reconstruct is this here green string at the top, comprised of this boring looking sequence of A, T, C's and G's, then the puzzle pieces are these individual reads and you can see them laid kind of um, from left to right here across the picture. And you'll note in this picture that the way that we fit the jigsaw pieces together is by looking at how they are similar to each other, where they overlap at their ends. These overlaps essentially tell us where one part of the jigsaw starts and the other part stops. And another thing to, 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 to conclude from this picture is that generally we'll sequence uh, the, the, the genome many times over because each of those reads is likely to contain some errors. And those errors, obviously, we don't want. We want to get rid of the errors. And so we, we oversample uh, the genome in order to be able to put it together uh, with high fidelity. So, so why is, is de novo genome assembly hard? Well, imagine that I give you a jigsaw to construct, but the jigsaw is just sky. So it's like this picture over on the left. Now imagine that I give you that jigsaw, but it has millions of pieces, okay? So de novo genome assembly is hard in exactly the same way because about 50% of our genome is composed of repetitive sequence. That is the same sequence that just occurs over and over and over, <laughs> right, uh, again. So um, in terms of technology, I, I showed you that curve with improvements. Under, underlying that, that improvement have been a succession of new sequencing technologies, new essentially machines uh, that are better and better at reading DNA. And since about 2007, we've had this uh, platform from Illumina, a California-based company, um, that is amazing. It produces short, so reads that are about 150 to 300, 300 bases, so 300 ACTs or Gs, um, and they're highly accurate. They're about 99.9% .9 accurate, so about one error every thousand bases or so, okay? And these reads are amazing and they have powered what we've called the sort of next generation sequencing revolution. They're the thing that came after the initial human genome project and allowed us um, to do many, many things. But for that problem of de novo genome assembly, where we're trying to put the jigsaw together without any, without any underlying information, we're just trying to do it from scratch, the Illumina jigsaw puzzle is just too hard. It has about 300 million pieces and because of all that sky that we have in our genome, it has just proven impossible to adequately solve. We can't put the genome together. So this is a, this is a great uh, UCSC story that I'm gonna tell you. But in 1989, um, whilst driving on Interstate 5 um, in California, uh, Dave Diemer, who's a professor um, in my department in BME, um, had a revelation and he pulled over, this is, 
apparently literally true. He pulled over to the side of the road. Don't know how you pull over to the side of the I-5, but anyway, he pulled over to the side of the road and he jotted down uh, this sketch, okay? Um, and what he imagined, so let me illustrate for you. What he imagined was a single strand of DNA. So remember, DNA has these two strands that complement to each other. So imagine kind of unpeeling, un unzipping the DNA, taking one strand of the DNA, right? That is just fractions of a nanometer wide and then passing it through a protein ion channel. I'll show you an animation in a minute, but you're passing it through a protein ion channel and then sensing how the current across a, a membrane changes as the DNA is threaded through that channel. So in this picture, this, which is, this is, a, this is a, a copy of his original sketch. In his picture, he has the DNA molecule, which you can see its backbone here. We've got the sugar phosphate background bone here. All right, we've got the individual bases, which you can see here, um, flowing through this pore, which is, which is kind of like a hole in a membrane, through this pore. And then because as the, as the molecule is traversing through, because it occludes ions, it essentially changes uh, the, 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 the it changes the current uh, the, the amount of flow through the pore of, of ions. So that was in 1989. So he had this vision in 1989, and it took until uh, around 2015 uh, for a company to commercialize and release an initial sequencing device based upon that idea. So to go from that kind of you know mental conception. Uh, uh, in 89 to 2015, uh, we get this, this amazing instrument that, that is called the MinIron. Uh, so the MinIron uh, comes out in, in 2015, and it is unusual as a sequencer in that it's not a great big brick. It's not like a massive uh, instrument. It's actually, you can't see, but this is actually pocket size. This is about, about the size of a cell phone. Um, in, in which that's actually a USB uh, A port right there. Okay. And what's great about the MinIron in comparison to the Illumina machine is that it can produce DNA reads that are up to millions of bases long. So although the error rate is significantly higher, and I'll talk about that, um, it can produce bases that are vastly, vastly longer than we could get out of the Illumina platform. So here's a, just a cartoon to illustrate the nanopore sequencing technology. So here's the, the, the protein ion channel that I described. Here's that single strand of DNA. And actually you can see the other strand is kind of flowing away in this direction, but you can see it passing through. I'll keep repeating here, passing through. And as it passes through, that creates a current difference that we can sense. Um, and that essentially we translate that current into sequences of A, C, Cs and Gs using, using fairly sophisticated signal processing and machine learning. So that's, that's it in a nutshell. But the MinIron, of course, has hundreds of these multiplexed in parallel so that we're reading from many, many, many of such pores all at the same time. And that allows us to get tremendous throughput in our sequencing. So, again, fast forwarding a little bit. In 2018, we used this MinIron sequencer uh, to, to de novo assemble for the very, very first time a whole human genome, um, which was amazing. You know, to, if you go from 2001 to 2018, the fact that we could do that with this you know, pocket-sized instrument, a single pocket-sized instrument is absolutely incredible. Um, but it did take 50 of these experiments, so 50 laborious experiments to repeat, and around about 100,000 um, computer hours uh, and about six weeks of wall time to generate the assembly, to do that, to put together the jigsaw puzzle. And the assembly quality was pretty good, uh, not perfect. It was still in hundreds of pieces. It wasn't like the complete picture, but we got, you know, good chunks of the jigsaw together. Um, and I should stress, uh, emphasize here that this work was uh, done, uh, led by Matane Jane, who's a um, research scientist uh, at UCSC, and was done in collaboration with my colleague Karen Mega and some others in an international uh, collaboration. So after that, I'm telling you this story, after that, um, ONT, so Oxford Nanopore Technologies, the, the maker of the MinIron, released the Promethine based on, I should say that um, a lot of this was based upon IP that was commercialized out of UC Santa Cruz and is licensed to Oxford, um, which is exciting. So the Promethine instrument is a, you can see it in this picture over here, is a, basically a much scaled up MinIron. It is kind of, you know, this is, this is a, that's a computer. So it's, it's kind of desktop size. 
Um, and it has about 300 times the throughput of a single minion. So when we got this instrument, um, we essentially had to go back to the drawing board and think about how to engineer our algorithms to deal with, you know, order of 300 times more throughput um, to process it and create genome assemblies in a timely manner. And this work um, is work of a series of graduate students um, in my lab, Ryan and Marina and Kishwa and Trevor, um, uh, as well as a, a great collaborator, Paolo Carnevali over at Chan Zuckerberg, and again, uh, Matane Jane. Um, so what we did essentially is kind of rethink, because my lab is principally a computational lab, rethink how we put together that jigsaw puzzle and then how we refine the jigsaw or the, our picture of the jigsaw once, once it comes out the other side. So the first thing we managed to do with the Prometheus, which was at the time pretty unprecedented, was to sequence not one human genome, but 11 human genomes in parallel on this one instrument um, at the same time. And instead of using 50 experiments, we got it down to just three experiments for each genome, right? So each genome was three experiments that could be, could be run concurrently and took three days to complete, okay? And you can see the graph over here on the right. I won't go through this in detail, but essentially this shows us the coverage because we sequence each uh, genome many times in order to remove errors. So, um, and here is the read length. So the way to read this plot, let's say let's take this uh, red bottommost line is that we sequenced um, say, uh, this is I think the 10 kilobase line. We sequenced um, 40 times, roughly speaking, 40 copies of the human genome for that sample in reads that were 10,000 bases or longer. And if you walk over here, this is a longer read length, this is stratified by read length, um, you'll see that we sequenced the genome um, at a, Five, I think a median of about seven X, uh, so seven times in reads longer than 100,000 bases or longer. So this is, this is a sort of cumulative distribution here. So um, all in, that was an absolute, you know, mass of data to process and to think about and to put together into, into a set of genomes. So on the other side of the, of the sequencing uh, development that we did, which is again, this was at the time unprecedented, was to think through how to actually assemble all that data and turn it into, um, in, into a genome uh, or into genomes, I should say. So we developed this uh, program in collaboration with, uh, with Paolo at, at Chan Zuckerberg, um, which could, instead of creating a de novo assembly in six weeks and 100,000 uh, computer hours, could produce an assembly in actually a few hours, about five hours uh, on a single computer, um, at a very, very uh, reasonable cost. And in fact, every single assembly that we generated of those 11 was actually much, much better than the one that we did in 2018. Although again, not perfect. Um, yeah, and these are stats over here, just sort of illustrating the error for different numbers of samples. And again, the, the contiguity, how um, contiguous our assembly was. Um, these are measured in, in millions of bases. So um, a story that I don't have time to tell you, but I, I want to point at it because it's important to mention. Um, my colleague, Karen Miga, um, and Adam Philippi over at NHGRI, um, in parallel to, to some of our efforts, um, have been focused on finishing the human genome. What does it mean to finish the genome? It means to actually complete the jigsaw. It means to have no missing pieces, to have every single base accounted for. So they have uh, done this, and that's why there was an article in the New York Times, um, um, middle of last year when the initial paper preprints, I should say, came out. Um, so they've done this, and this gives us for the first time a whole human genome in which everything is done, absolutely everything is done, and acts as a reference and therefore a benchmark for us to compare uh, our much more um, performant and, and non-manual methods um, to, 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 to. And so um, I advise, by the way, there, there will be a whole raft of the papers um, about this coming out in a special issue of science in April. So that's one to look out for. But anyway, from our purposes, we have now a perfect human genome that has been completed and we can compare to that. Um, and we did do that. So we took, uh, this is for one benchmark sample. We took that new de novo assembly algorithm that we devised um, and we ran it. And we then compared the sequences that we got out to that perfect human genome assembly or near perfect. I should, when I say perfect, it actually does have 
a very, very small number of errors, it's about an error every, a uh, little bit less than every 10 million bases, which means um, you know, a few hundred errors in the context of billions. But anyway, we compared, we compared to that near perfect genome, um, our, our assembly that just came straight out of the back of Shasta after just a few hours. Um, and you can see that we put together about 36 of the uh, 46 chromosome arms uh, completely um, without, without any breaks in contiguity across them. And where we do break, and this is worth mentioning, where we do break tends to be right in the middle of chromosomes. You can see this by the, the little red lines, which are the places that are called centromeres. So these are regions of the, of the genome involved in, uh, in mitosis and meiosis in chromosome separation. Um, and are essential for, for, for the whole kinetic core complex. Um, and those tend to be the most repetitive sequences in our genome. So that is the sort of last bastion of, 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 of hardness for us to try to be able to complete. So just to summarize this little tiny bit of the talk, um, over, over 20 years, and really with the advent of nanopore sequencing, because prior to that, with Illumina sequencing, de novo assembly, so putting together the genome completely fresh was just not possible. So with nanopore sequencing and you know those 20 years since the initial human genome assembly, we've seen the costs reduced from about 3 billion to about 3,000. That's to, in today's dollars, that's roughly the cost of doing each one of those 11 genomes that we did in that paper. And we've reduced the time, the total time to generate the human genome to of the order of less than a week. Um, now. And in fact, I think to, if you were to say to me today, I think we could do uh, significantly quicker, just to two or three days. Okay, so given that we have now, you know, um, got to this point where we can put together these jigsaw puzzles almost completely um, and for not very much money or drastically less money, what can we, what can we do with that? Well, we are just one species of an estimated 8.7 million that are still alive, extant, uh, on, on our planet. Um, here is an evolutionary tree. Uh, it shows the sort of uh, tree of life. Um, and you can see that if you, if, I know it's a little bit small, but Homo sapiens, humans are here, okay? Here are uh, some of the great apes and other primates uh, and so forth around this tree. There are about 1.2 million of the 8.7 million estimated uh, species have now been characterized. Most of those are plants and insects, but actually there are about 66,000 vertebrate species that are alive today. And for me, when I see these numbers, I realize that we have an absolutely unprecedented opportunity that if we miss it, we're as a species, you know, just so short-sighted, an absolutely unprecedented opportunity to characterize these genomes and to learn about all of the amazing molecular mechanisms that, that like the diversity of life on earth has generated. Because every single species is a, you know, a torrid path of natural selection in which molecules, proteins, you know, genes, et cetera, have been shaped and provide us potentially incredible tools for in the future synthetic biology applications and engineering, and just in general to marvel at the you know, diversity of life. So yes, we can put together the human genome, but actually we shouldn't look, think of ourselves as being in isolation. We are really part of one big family tree. As far as we know, life, we have no reason to believe that life evolved more than once on this planet. Every, all, uh, all of these species share a common origin as far as we can tell. Um, and we should be trying to look back and understand where we all came from. So one of the things that we've been doing um, in my lab for a long time now is actually to, to, un, to, to, to compare genomes of different species and different individuals and different species um, to try to understand how they're related. And the way you do that essentially is you align them. So just like I was showing you earlier, a picture of uh, a reference with reads aligned to it, you now you can think about taking two genomes or, or N genomes and lining them up together and trying to identify the places where they are the same, where they share a common ancestor, and then the places where they are different. And um, my group has, I say, for a long time been trying to figure out the way to do this most accurately. It's a really difficult problem because um, natural selection and um, evolution 
uh, has created a huge amount of ways to change our genome. So mutation uh, of it has many, many different forms. So we have you know, single base changes and we have big changes that rearrange the genome and we have changes that copy bits of the genome and so forth. There, the diversity of changes is really, really staggering. And so we've worked for a long time on algorithms that essentially take a set of genomes and then try to figure out where they're the same. So in this picture, I have, um, you know, I'm imagining that I'm putting together a picture of how these species are related up an evolutionary tree. And the way I do that essentially is for each genome is to identify using um, algorithms that I won't get into, but identify uh, which bits look the same and which bits look different. And then to try to put together the ancestral orientation given those genomes and potentially other genomes in the tree, uh, put together the ancestral structure of the putative ancestor of those genomes and so forth, walking all the way back to, you know, potentially the base of vertebrates. So um, we actually, this is work that was published a couple of years ago now, uh, put together the very largest ever uh, alignment uh, and reconstruction of vertebrate genomes. So it contains 600 genomes, about 360 birds, about 240 mammals. You can see this is the tree for all of those species. Um, the birds are all here in, in, in green um, and mammal, uh, we are somewhere down here. So we put together this enormous alignment of six, 600 species or, or roughly 1% of all vertebrates. Um, why would we do this? What's, what's actually useful? Um, so it's, it, it, one, there are, there are lots of reasons why it's useful. But I think one thing that you can, that, that's relatively easy to understand um, is that by looking at different genomes and the way that they change, we can actually get a picture from evolution about what is important. So think about it, right? So mutations um, define every new genome. So pretty much, you know, you or I differ from our parents by some number of new mutations that occur, occurred in uh, in us and only in us, they're not present in our parents. Um, and of course, most mutations are neutral. That is in across the vast landscape of our genome, they don't really have much effect at all. We, they are free to change and um, they don't really um, change us. But then there's a reasonable, reasonable fraction of, of mutations that are actually bad. So if you get them, then they are from, you know, mildly deleterious to very deleterious, right? So they might have an impact on your you know, fitness as an organism, uh, to be brutal. Um, and of course, then a tiny, tiny fraction of mutations are potentially positive. And those are the things that you know, drive, uh, drive selection. Um, but mutation and natural selection act on the genome to essentially scatter it over time with tolerable variations. So here I took, this is a famous picture of, of bullet holes that were um, essentially dotted onto, uh, on, uh, that were essentially uh, illustrated on a picture, a cartoon picture of a plane showing which, which areas of the plane could tolerate being shot. Um, and presumably the areas that don't have any bullet holes are the areas that if you get a, you know, get shot at, um, get a bullet hole through, the plane goes down and, 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 and therefore it never returns. So these are, these are an illustration of something called survivor bias. Well, our genomes are undergoing a similar process. It's not quite the same, but it's a similar process, right? So we can think of looking at, you know, a whole set of genomes, hundreds of genomes, and looking at essentially the places where there aren't bullet holes, right? And, 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 and picking those out to essentially say, well, these are obviously important. These are potentially what's, actually can't change because if it does change, something breaks, right? And we call these conserved elements. They are, if you will, the engines of our genome. So when I give you a, a very large alignment of hundreds of species, I have amazing power to potentially detect these conserved elements. It's essentially repeating this evolutionary experiment over and over and over again. And the size of the alignment, the number of species that we can compare, essentially um, gives us a power to detect conservation. So in earlier studies where we had sort of 53 uh, birds, we had for each base in the genome, we would expect to see across all 50 of the genomes that were aligned at that position, 
on average, about four of the, the genomes would show a change, okay? Um, so we call that about four substitutions per site, okay? Um, there would be four different changes that we could root in the tree, I should say, okay? In our 363-way alignment, there are actually a mind-boggling 16 and a half changes per base, okay? So for a base to be changed across evolutionary time, um, that just implies a just incredible number of, of lives and experiments that have taken place that we can kind of um, rewind to see what is important and what is not important. Uh, it's, for me, this is, this is just an incredible number. So with, that, uh, with our essentially our microscope that shows us what's important by virtue of not having any change, um, we can go and look at the different functional elements that we know about in our genome and see how well they are indeed conserved. And when we look at, I won't, I won't um, go through all these categories, but when we look at the genes in particular, we see in our, in our much larger alignment, so this is our 300 way alignment versus these much smaller alignments, we see a vastly higher fraction of the genome apparently being under some form of conservation. Um, and that was very gratifying to see. We can basically show that almost all of the bits of our genes are definitely important in the sense that when they change, there is some form of negative consequence for the organism. And when we zoom in and look at individual genes, not so not looking at everything on aggregate, but look at an indivi at individual genes, we can actually see that the conservation predictions really, really closely mirror what we know um, from biological experiments that tell us about the effect of change on the gene. So in this picture, and I'll take you through it because it's interesting. Um, what we did, what well, I'm plotting, um, this, this is the gene. So we're looking, we're sort of zoomed in, looking at, at one gene, which is of the order of thousands of bases long. And we are looking at, at the top here, this thing in blue, essentially is the conservation prediction. So the, the higher the bar, the more conserved. Okay, so the more that evolution does not tolerate change at that, at that location. And then um, the mirror of that, that you can see down here, this red thing, this is from functional experiments where we essentially go in using molecular biology techniques to change the gene by bashing it, basically mutating it um, at all these different sites. And we can see how much um, the effect of the mutation in this you know, molecular assay right, mirrors what we understand from evolution, what evolution would predict. And you can see that the two do look very, very closely aligned. They are very, very similar to each other. They are essentially mirrors of each other. And if we zoom right in to individual bases, then actually we see with kind of exquisite detail that our predictions of individual conservation from those trillions of lives that have taken place in our, in our ancestors, those trillions of lives, um, that, that th those predictions are really very closely match what we know from mutational pictures, but also also predict which changes in our genome are actually likely to lead to disease. So in this case, this gene is the, um, uh, it's the uh, low density lipoprotein receptor gene. Um, so it, when mutated, can result in um, a nasty syndrome called hypercholesterolemia, where you produce too much cholesterol. Um, and we know um, from, from clinical reports that certain changes result in this phenotype, in, the, in, this, in this disorder. And the cha those changes are exactly mirrored by what evolution says should not change, essentially cannot change over long evolutionary time. So we have essentially three lines of evidence here, functional screens, cl um, clinical data from actual, you know, actual patients, and then this very, very long evolutionary story, all lining up to tell us that this base or this, this particular site in the genome cannot change. So um, again, switching gears a little bit, so going from the very, very long range to the much, much, much more recent, um, we can also look between different human beings at how we differ. So human genomes are between 99.8 and 99.9% the same. Um, so that's roughly, you know, one in 500 to one in a thousand bases different, right? But all the rest of it, just the same. But of course, each genome is about 6 billion bases long. So if you do the math, that implies about five or six million differences between any two people who were not in the same family, right, um, per, per individual. So it's sort of paradoxically, we are both incredibly similar 
but of course we differ by really really large numbers of different by really number large numbers of changes so how do we uh, understand those differences right i've showed you that evolution can can um give us insight um but actually there are potentially lots of ways that we can potentially learn by studying people, by using them as natural observations. And so um, in this, this last part of the talk, I'm gonna focus on human and I'm going to just um, switch, switch uh, your way of thinking. So before I was talking about de novo assembly, this idea of putting together the jigsaw puzzle from scratch. Well, with reference-based uh, assembly or analysis, we don't attempt to put the genome together from scratch. Instead, we take a reference human genome, which in this case is the picture, right? And we do the jigsaw by essentially trying to take the piece of the jigsaw and find where they fit on the existing picture. It's like doing a jigsaw on top of the picture of the jigsaw you're doing, right? You're trying to fit each piece into the corresponding place on the map. I have a picture of that. So it looks the same, the reference here. Now the reference is not the sequence we're putting together, but it's actually a different genome. And so of course there will be differences between the sample that we are attempting to, to analyze and that genome. And those differences are the genetic variants. So in this picture, there's a difference at this G in the reference, apparently the individual has um, a C, okay? Has, has a cytosine, right? And at this C, there's a thymine, right? And just as a quick aside on the human reference genome, um, the, on July 7th, 2001, the human genome draft was actually put on the internet by uh, UCSC's um, David Hauser and Jim Kent. And actually, many people don't realize this, but we're still using that genome today, right? That is still the key reference that the entire of our field uses today. And it's also worth mentioning that it's haploid. So what that means is instead of being 6 billion bases in length, it's only 3 billion bases in length because it has one representative copy of each chromosome. Recall I said that chromosomes are paired. Well, here we've just got one copy of each of the pairs, not two. So yeah, this is the long history of genomics. We're using the sequence that Jim and David put together some 20 years ago. And so when we compare a new sample to that reference, so here in this picture I'm showing you, the new sample, um, are essentially as corresponding to these reads. The reads are now just shown as these, uh, these gray bars. And I'm only showing you the differences in this picture. So where it's the same, we just color it gray, but where it's different, um, for example, we've got a deletion of a base here. So there's a removal of a base with respect to the reference or an addition by these purple bars indicating there's some extra sequence or substitutions where we can see different bases here. So in this reference model, we compare the genome, um, we, we compare a new samples uh, genome, its reads, to the reference. And then we try to essentially identify the genetic changes. But um, it turns out that with nanopore sequencing, I mentioned earlier that the error rate can be higher. With nanopore sequencing, um, solving this problem, translating this picture into which genetic variants are present and which are not with, with, with some accuracy is actually not trivial at all, um, because the reads do have a you know, pretty high underlying error rate. And so, um, again, this is work um, from a bunch of grads in the lab. I'll come, I'll come back to this in a second. But um, what they essentially did was take these, these pileups, uh, we call them, so these alignments of reads to the reference, and then couple them with deep neural network models, so machine learning models um, that essentially can look at the analogy is to think of them as looking at these images and then guessing what the genetic variants are or calling the, what the genetic variants are. And, um, you know, in very, very simple terms, these networks are able to actually make, uh, to solve this problem pretty accurately. Um, and in fact, so this is actually collaborative work between um, my lab, so uh, Kishwar and Trevor and others in the lab, uh, and, um, and folks at, over at Google, uh, Andrew Carroll and um, uh, and um, what we were able to do um, in this reference guided model is demonstrate that nanopore sequencing, the accuracy of nanopore sequencing could actually um, equal or in some senses exceed what had previously been done with those much more accurate Illumina reads that are albeit much, much, much shorter. 
And in fact, we entered a, a competition. The, the FDA holds a, a competition every um, so often in order to evaluate how everybody's doing in, in genetic variant calling. And we won two of the awards um, in that competition by demonstrating just how good nanopore sequencing has got at identifying bases. So to give you some context here, um, we're showing this is a precision recall plot. The nanopore results are here in red uh, versus the alumina results in, in orange. And the recall, the, the fraction of, 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 of the variants that we got uh, that were present in the sample is significantly higher than with the, uh, with the um, alumina. And the precision is slightly lower, but it's very, very close. So the fraction of wrong calls that we make is very slightly ho higher with nanopore, but still we're at you know, 0.998 in terms of accuracy. So this technology has gotten to the point where it's really pretty good and good enough, as I'm gonna show you, um, for, for medical uh, examination. So that brings me to, to discussing kind of the clinical application of this project. So um, just over a year ago, um, a colleague, you and Ashley over at Stanford, who's a, a cardiologist, uh, contacted me and some others and said, wouldn't it be great if we took what you, you know, what people have been doing with nanopore sequencing and tried to use it in the clinic to speed up the diagnosis of, of undiagnosed or, or rare disease uh, in a critical care um, condition. So just to give you some context here, you know, when a patient, it could be a baby, is admitted to the, say, the NICU or you know, into the ICU, right? And they have no other, you know, there's no uh, pre-existing uh, reason for them to have been admitted. Perhaps they've suddenly had a heart attack or they've had a seizure, right? And there's no obvious environmental cause or infectious cause that we believe is causing it. At that point, um, clinicians are going to strongly suspect that there is an underlying genetic cause. You know, why has this baby suddenly had a heart attack, right? And so they're going to wonder, is there a genetic cause? And currently, uh, or, or prior to this work at least, um, the, 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 the standard was to send away and do sequencing either of just the genes or the whole genome, but regardless, um, it would take, it would be done with the Illumina technology and it would typically take, um, you know, 12 weeks, for example, to do, to do the exome over at Stanford. And of course, 12 weeks in that kind of setting is enormously expensive uh, delay and also enormously uh, potentially, uh, you know, upsetting and delays, you know, treatment of patients. So we wanted, you know, could we take what we've been doing with nanopore sequencing and, you know, reduce the amount of time to around a day? And I, there isn't time to talk through this, the, the, the whole pipeline, but in, in, in essence, it's similar to the steps I showed you earlier. Essentially, there is a sample collection, a preparation step, and then a whole bunch of sequencing and very clever algorithms. And then out the back of that are a large number of variants, millions of variants that then need to be winnowed down clinically to a set of variants that are probably, right, uh, probably causative, right, um, so that we can make a genetic diagnosis. And again, um, these are the, the students involved, Sneha and John over at Stanford and Kishbar um, and, and others at Santa Cruz and, and Ewan. So we developed this and, you know, long story short, um, we actually took this and ran this in uh, with patients as a clinical trial at Stanford um, with 12 different patients. Uh, and we were able to actually make a genetic diagnosis in five of them, the ones shown here in bold, um, number of a number of different um, conditions that were identified. Um, and the time, this plot shows you so that each one of these uh, sets of bars here is a patient. The time here is the total time to get to diagnosis. So um, the, 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 the ones on the white were our sort of first batch. And then after we optimized, you can see the ones in the gray, this sort of lightly gray, are our second batch. And you can see that after a bit of optimization, we were able to get the time from literally from blood draw to clinician coming back to talk with the parents or with the individual um, down to about, uh, in the best case, about uh, seven and a half hours. That was our, our patient aid. And in fact, um, we, were, we were awarded a Guinness World Record, no kidding, a Guinness World Record for fastest DNA sequencing technique for having achieved this milestone of being able to go through a complete, you know, end-to-end -end sequencing, uh, generating data equivalent to what that Human Genome Project did, actually much better in many ways, right? but in, in actually about an hour and a half, and then doing all of the analysis, uh, sorry, a couple of hours, I should say, and then doing all of the analysis um, to get to a, a diagnosis you know, um, in, in, in under 12 hours, which is, I, I think, just kind of quite remarkable. Um, oh, 
Oh, sorry, I skipped back. Oh, how did that happen? Um, that was weird. Okay, uh, so just in the last uh, minute and a half I have, um, I want to finally switch gears and say that a big push um, in, the, in the field now, um, or rather, let me, let me rephrase that, has been a huge effort to sequence genomes over the last 20 years and to start to try to understand uh, the genetic causes of, of many different diseases. But in the process of doing that, not, you know, this was not an intentional process, but in the process of doing that, we have vastly oversampled people who can call their ancestry European, right? Who have you know, recent European ancestry. And we have vastly, vastly undersampled uh, people um, from, from potentially other um, geographic ancestries. And this is shown here just in red, the Europeans here are in red. And this is the fraction of all individuals that have been part of these experiments, um, you know, over time. And you can see that you know, the red is, is the vast majority. And yet, actually, if this is this stark bar plot shows you the actual distribution of different ancestries that we have in, in the human population. So you can see that we have vastly, vastly oversampled Europeans at this point. And if we want precision medicine and what we're trying to do in genomics to benefit everybody equally, we can't, we can't continue to hew this path. So um, in, in the last, I guess I'm at, at time at this point, but um, the final thing that I wanted to mention is that um, within you know, this space of human genomes, we're working at, with a, a large project um, that is um, being directed from Santa Cruz to essentially create a new generation of, of human reference sequence. That is not actually one human genome, but 350 different diverse human genomes, all of which are of at reference quality. And the intent is then to integrate those genomes into what we call a map, a reference map of genome var variation. So um, I won't uh, belabor this, but essentially you can imagine taking these people who've been selected from all across the world and consented appropriately uh, and, and, and ethically, um, and then you know, assemble their genomes and then where they are the same, stuck them together and where they are different, allow them to diverge. And when you do that, you no longer have uh, a reference genome that is a linear set of strings, but rather you have something that we consider to be a mathematical graph. So for people who aren't, uh, aren't graph theorists, a graph essentially, you can think of it as being a picture in which you have uh, circles and edges, okay? And you draw circles and those represent the snippets of DNA and you draw edges and those represent the connections between the snippets of DNA. And so in that, in that picture, we can essentially create a complete map of all of the variation that is present um, across the human population, or at least the common variation that's present across the human population. And we've actually shown, um, this, was, this came out in science at the end of last year, um, we've actually shown that using these approaches, we can really, really substantially reduce uh, the, the number of errors that we make um, in, 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 our, in our variant influence by about a factor of two, actually, in terms of false positives and false negatives. This is where it was led by a bunch of grad students and postdocs in the lab, and Yoni Siren, who's a, a research scientist. So, um, okay, I know I'm over time. So um, I guess I've got a few takeaways here. The first thing I wanna say is that human genomics is developing much faster than most people realize. Um, a lot of this is happening in labs. It's, its impact is, is not yet reached people in the clinic and so they don't appreciate just how quickly things are moving. But actually genomics is kind of the, the tip of the spear in biology is really showing that algorithms and software, so, data analysis. My lab has no pipettes. We are a dry lab, but data analysis can actually, um, you know, potentially revolutionize the way in which uh, we think about you know, genomics, but in, but in large biology. Um, genomics has this incredible potential to enable precision medicine. That is unquestionable. There is so much more that we have to learn, and we are only right at the very beginning of being able to show just how predictive our genomes can be in terms of helping us um, to tailor therapies and so forth. But, you know, as a caveat to that, we have to balance the rapid rate of learning that we have with our responsibility to create an equitable future for everybody, right? And that is why I'm so passionate about what we're doing with the, with the, the, the Human Pan Genome Project, because it really does hopefully set us on a course in which everybody's genome is much more equally represented uh, in that central reference. So um, I just want to acknowledge a, a lot of people um, so here's a, this is a picture taken uh, sometime during the pandemic where we're out on Seabright Beach. Um, and there's a lot of different grad students in the lab. I particularly want to call out for this talk, I want to particularly want to call out 
Kishwa and Trevor uh, and Ryan and Melissa and Shen and John uh, and Jordan and Jonas, I guess pretty much everybody um, who, who, whose work I definitely talked about. There's uh, lots of other people who were not in this picture who are around. I al always um, should acknowledge David, who was my postdoc mentor um, before I became faculty at Santa Cruz and uh, is a huge inspiration to me. And Karen and Matane's work, who I spoke about, uh, and, uh, and others uh, as well, Joel, who's now over at Google, um, and then the folks over at Stanford, whose project I talked about, the folks over at Google that we collaborate with, um, Adam from the T2T project, and many of our funders as well. Um, and with that, I'm happy to take any questions that um, you may or may not have. Well, well thank you, Professor Payton, that was for that fascinating talk. I think this is uh, it's an area that's moving incredibly quickly, and, and um, I think a lot, a lot of people have a lot of questions about this. This is your invitation to type questions in the Q&A box. Uh, we have a few getting started, but I'd love to see a lot more, so um, type your questions in now. And also a reminder, you can, uh, you can click on the thumbs up button and upvote uh, questions that are similar to yours. We'll ask them more quickly. Um, I'll point out, we, we did have, have a quick question from uh, Neo. He asked what de novo means, we had an answer from Professor Karplus. Um, I think you used uh, de novo a few times in your presentation. It means it means of new or using no prior information. So thank you, uh, Kevin, for answering that. Um, first question I have is from Stuart. Um, would you please explain how the DNA sequencing analysis that you have described compares with the DNA testing used for paternity um and criminal testing which has been around for many years and i'll, I'll also ask like since technology has been advancing pretty rapidly should we should we retest if we've had our um you know 23andme sequence done recently right so yeah there, there isn't there isn't there isn't time in this talk to go through the many generations of, of different kinds of genetic genetic analysis that we do but um broadly speaking um the when you get 23andme done uh, you can think of it as like um, having your DNA barcode taken. So think of your genome as uh, essentially having, um, think of it like you're sampling every um, few thousand bases and you're sampling an individual change and you're assaying whether or not at that site you have a particular base or an other particular base, but you only sample that base. And so we do that with a 23andMe chip, you do that about half a million to a million times. So you get about a million differences. But what you don't get with that technology is any of the information about the variants that lie between. So those, those sites that you sample represent places in the genome where people commonly vary. That's why we sample them. Um, and so they tell us a lot about common variation. So if you go to 23andMe and you look at your genome, it can show you a lot of stuff like your ancestry and so forth. And it's all based upon recent ancestry. It's all based upon uh, the, that, that barcode, if you will, that sampling. Um, but what it doesn't do is tell you about the rarer variants that you may have, or maybe just your family has, or you know, uh, the, the things that are not common in the population. And so to fill that in, that's where you have to go and do complete uh, genetic sequencing. So 23andMe is, um, and, and other similar technologies, for example, technologies that look at, uh, at uh, the sizes of repeats, um, which is an older technology, uh, are very useful, um, but they don't, they don't give us the complete picture of what the genome looks like. Um, they are sufficient for identifying paternity uh, or telling us whether or not, you know, um, uh, whether or not, you know, we, uh, we have you know, potentially blue eyes or predicting whether we have blue eyes, but they're not necessarily uh, sufficient for telling us um, about the, the rarer things that are in our genomes. So Jonathan asks, are there promising ML, which I assume are machine learning approaches that use evolutionary data to guide de novo assembly? Do you think these approaches will eventually replace classical rule or rule-based assemblers? Well, uh, that's, a, that's an out there question. Um, so that's a, it's an interesting idea, right? So, you know, if we've got if not access to just the human genome, but access to many, many genomes, we could potentially think about any new genome fitting onto that, that evolutionary tree. So we could think about trying to kind of assemble that genome given all of that knowledge. Um, that is a very nice idea. Um, in practice, I don't know anyone who's ever tried to 
do it. Um, because in practice, what you can do essentially is, well, first off, normally you know roughly the kind of species that you're assembling. So uh, you can figure out what might be a good reference to compare against. Um, but if you, even if you had no knowledge, you could still do some comparison of those reads to try and figure out which sample in your evolutionary tree would be uh, close. So you could, it's, it's an interesting idea, but I don't know if, I don't think anyone has, has ever attempted to do it um, just because there are simpler ways of, of doing it. But it's, it's interesting. Well, we have a question from Rick. Um, interested in the sequencing devices themselves. What is, how, how, what is the distribution of sequencing devices like? How common is it? And what is the timeline for a sequencing to be, device to be local to most major cities and hospital systems? Um, that's a good question. Uh, so there are sequencing devices all over the place now. Um, I'm not <clears throat> I'm not sales rep for any of those companies, so I can't give you exact numbers, but um, I would say um, at this point, um, many, I mean, uh, companies like Invite, uh, company, you know, count, council uh, personalists, there are a whole bunch of them, offer uh, genome sequencing. There are hundred, probably hundreds, I would think, of installed machines in the Bay Area alone. Um, and, uh, you know, across the country, um, I would say thousands uh, at this point. Um, that min-iron sequencer is so uh, cheap and portable, it only costs about a thousand bucks. They, at one point, they used to give them away when you went to the meeting. Um, they, that, I think they're probably the, by uh, install, they're probably the most common sequencer, although definitely not by volume. They don't generate the most amount of data, um, but they're, they're, they're used all over the place now in the field. Um, so sequencing is, is much more, because it's so common to many uh, molecular biology applications, it's, it's, it's everywhere. but we're a little ways away from people having them in their own homes, perhaps, perhaps one day. So Trevor asks, how do you think nanopore sequencing and the use of reference or model genome will impact personalized medicine, specifically in the context of CRISPR gene editing? Right, so I didn't, I didn't talk about gene editing. Everything I talked about today was about reading the genome. In order to edit the genome, you definitely want to be able to read the genome very well, because um, for many, for, for several reasons, but importantly, um, any change that you want to introduce in editing, um, you want to be very sure about the change that you're making, and you want to be sure that there isn't some other similar sequence in the genome that you might edit, uh, you know, um, by mistake. So it's, it's as a prerequisite to being able to good, do good gene editing, we need to be able to comprehensively sequence uh, new gen uh, genomes. And so, I think we're not so very far away from genome sequencing technology, and I'm not sure it will be nanopore, probably, um, but not certainly, uh, being sufficiently common that uh, it will, for example, replace what we do with 23andMe, that we will see complete sequencing uh, replace the, the chip-based approach. Um, so that will happen, I think, and I think that we're already at a point where for many diagnostic cases, it makes sense to do complete genome sequencing. People are publishing economic papers now showing that um, for newborns, for example, there are enough conditions where doing genome sequencing is cheaper than doing lots of individual tests. And I think that we're not so far away from that, therefore becoming a standard of care. The problem we have with DNA that I, I guess was, there isn't time to talk about is that DNA is obviously um, enormously personal, um, has uh, uncertain predictive potential. It potentially, there's a lot that we can learn from that DNA, right? And it's also identifiable, right? From for a forensics point of view. Um, so we as a society don't necessarily want all of our genomes to all be publicly available. In fact, I think that would be very dystopian. Um, so we're, we, we have this uh, challenge with, with genomics that sequencing will get to the point quite soon where it's easily cheap enough for everybody to get their DNA done, but uh, to get their genome done, but we won't, we'll have problems with sharing that information. And further, um, because we have challenges with sharing it, uh, we also have challenges with interpreting it. Our ability to read the DNA has far outstripped our ability to interpret what it means. And so we're trying, you know, 
part of the sort of uh, chicken and egg process that we're in right now is as we gather more genomes, we learn more about what they mean. And then as we learn more about what we meet, what they mean, we're able to kind of uh, justify doing more sequencing. So um, I, I think that this is coming and its impact on medicine will be profound. I don't know if it'll be nanopore sequencing only, but it is, it is coming. I think you, you touched on this a bit. Uh, we have a question from Adam. What do you think about the future of privacy when it comes to DNA sequences with companies like Ancestry, 23andMe having access to customer DNA? It's, it's, I mean, they already do, right? So um, when you get your 23andMe or Ancestry done, um, you consent to them but generally, uh, certainly keeping your digital information, but generally there's a tick box which says they're going to keep your biosample as well, which means that in the future, they could very well go and sequence it. That is extract your whole genome, not just the common bits, uh, which maybe you'd be more okay with sharing, uh, but also all the rarer bits too. Um, I think it has profound, I mean, we as a, we should ask ourselves a question, are we, are we comfortable with that? I think, um, I, I think it's debatable. I, I, do, I do think it's debatable. There are definitely pros and cons um, uh, to that. I, I think that um, in general, as a society, is this is something that becomes very important. Medical right now, it's, it has mostly been a curiosity, unless you happen to have a rare disease, which, by the way, many many people do. I mean, we will all die, so and our genome will be a part of that. Um, but but right now, it, it, genomics has been somewhat of a curiosity for most people. But we will get to a point where it is no longer a curiosity, and then. We have to figure out how we are prepared to share that information with our doctor, with the clinical team, with whoever. And I don't think that we have gotten to the point um, of maturity yet where we, where we know how that's going to shake out. Um, but, but, it is, but it's coming. Uh, and there are, and I should say that there are, there are groups within genomics, like the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, which was um, uh, co-founded by David uh, Hausler, um, who are trying to think through the privacy uh, implications of all of that and uh, to think about how to, we can use this information responsibly. We have a question from Robert. Uh, I think this uh, uh, goes back to a few things you mentioned in the talk, but maybe you could summarize how are errors detected? Right, so, so you, different ways of doing this, right? But, but normally, um, let's say that we're comparing to that reference. So we've got the reference and now we're lining up the reads from the, uh, from the sample. Um, most of the time, the errors will stand out because either one read or a very small number of those reads will, will have the error and all the other reads at that location will not have the error. And furthermore, we can actually use our knowledge from the reference to, to tell us how likely a change at that site is, in fact. Um, so we can put all that information together and then we can kind of clean up the reads and figure out what are the real changes and what are the not real changes. The challenge comes when the, um, the errors are correlated where you get the same error over and over again. Um, and it's not because, um, and it's because of the non-randomness of some of the errors that we get. And that, that, has, been, that has, proven what, has proven to be the difficult bit. A question from Jonathan. What data sets do you believe are most crucial for healthcare applications like personalized medicine, gene therapy, et cetera? Are there significant advantages to uh, longitudinal sequencing studies? You may have to define that for us. Oh, right. Yeah. Um, so longitudinal study uh, where you potentially sequence a person's genome or say, remember that every cell in your body has a copy of the genome and actually over, we say it's one genome, but actually over time, they're all slightly different, right? Because every time your cells divide, mutations arise. And so longitudinal studies essentially will attempt to look at the genome in cells over, over a lifespan. Um, and we, we know, we know that, um, just not to go off on one, but, but uh, we know that uh, over time, well before we see problems emerge, um, our cells do acquire mutations that make them uh, more proliferative, or some of the cells that acquire mutations that make them more proliferative. And the selection happens in our body um, and that that ultimately favors cancer. And that's why, you know, if you got old enough, you pretty much will get cancer. Um, so there is this evolutionary process that's taking place in our cells. And so there is this, that in, all, in the genomes of all of our cells. And so it is very important for us to be able to study that process uh, and understand this somatic evolution uh, that takes place in each and every one of us. Um, 
So that's, that's very interesting because in the future, it may allow us to predict cancer many years before it emerges or, um, you know, um, and to understand where it's coming from. Uh, and, um, but, but that's, that's one kind of information that we might want to collect. Um, I think right now, we're still at a phase where um, just, if, 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 if you could give me the ideal cohort, um, you want to sequence as many people as possible and you want to get as much information about those people, about their healthcare, about their life, as you possibly can. And then that obviously flies in the face of, it's kind of in direct uh, contention with the issues of privacy, right? So on the one hand, we want to collect as all the genetic information and, <clears throat> and all of the healthcare information, because that allows us to then look at, you know, oh, isn't it interesting that th when this variant occurs, this condition arises, right? It allows us to see that in exquisite detail. Um, but at the same time, we have to consider uh, the, the considerations of privacy and so forth. So um, we, uh, we as researchers want to find ethical ways to get as much information about as many genomes, probably millions and millions. We're at the stage, people probably don't realize this, but large cohorts these days are in the hundreds of thousands. We gather hundreds of thousands of genomes together. I'm part of the TopMed project. We sequenced 160,000 human genomes in that project to study uh, heart, lung, blood disorders. So we want as many genomes as we can, and we want as much information as we can, but we have to balance that with patient privacy uh, and so forth. Um, that's where we are today. In the future, I think we'll get to a point where we don't just gather the genome, but we gather the genome and many other measurements from individuals over their lifetime in order to make predictions. And that will be very interesting. I have a question from Stuart uh, having to do with conserved elements. And he wonders if the examples of having five fingers or having two eyes, if those are, are good examples of that, of that principle. Um, uh, those, are, those are dramatic phenotypes. Um, when we say something is, when I say that a mutation, uh, one of those bullet holes in the genome, right? When I say that it has a negative impact, people need to appreciate that um, even quite subtle negative impacts um, have over time, over the evolutionary time, strong fitness effects. So most mutations that are negative are negative in, in not ways like an extra digit or you know <laughs> a tail or something developing um, or, or, or you know but actually negative in in much more subtle ways um, that you know maybe it makes us more susceptible to infection and therefore we're going to develop at a younger age slightly higher likelihood of dying uh, before before reproducing it's those kinds of things um, so most of, most of the most of those deleterious changes are not as dramatic or as uh, as um, as visible as you know as um, you know, uh, potentially um, yeah, having uh, a hand or or, a ma or you know physical malformation, but but you know obviously um, the the ways we are. I, I guess I just want to preface that by saying we are all every single person's genome. Yours, I don't. I mean this is no offense, but every single person listening to this and everybody alive has variants in their genome that are deleterious. In fact, it's just by definition, right? We can't, you can't roll a dice 3 billion times and come up and come up, you know, uh, lucky every single time, just not possible. We all have, we're all broken machines. The reason that we have two copies of everything is because, simple fact, everybody around, everybody listening here has a, has a variant that if they'd had two copies, if they'd inherited that variant from both mom and dad, they would not be alive. Right? We, we have this redundancy. The reason we get two copies of everything is partly because of the redundancy that that gives us. Um, so we're all, we're all broken in interesting ways, but, but it's also important to remember the, pr the principle of pleiotropy when we think about variation. So pleiotropy means in simple terms that one, from one variant, you can have many effects. So a variant that might maybe make me less, I don't know, fast as a runner, let's say, or more susceptible to an infection might on the other hand uh, change my, uh, my, the way I think a little bit. Maybe that's an interesting change. Um, so, you know, it, we shouldn't, it, it's a very, when we think about conserved elements, it is a very brutal calculus, but in terms of human variation, we should never forget human stories that are, you know, that are, that are part of that. Wow. Um, we have a, 
I think a very topical question from Sarah. Is this technology usable for viruses? Would it be practical for using for disease control? That's a great question. Yes, absolutely. I mean, so I think we've all gone through the last year, two years, and everybody in genomics has realized that public health is uh, almost in the dark ages in terms of genome sequencing. And it, that is changing. Um, you know, we saw uh, millions now of COVID genomes that have been sequenced and put together, right? The fact that we know about variants, right? That we've all talked to, you know, Delta and Omicron and so forth that become part of our, you know, regular uh, conversation is because of that genome sequencing, right? Um, so uh, absolutely, I think everybody realizes that pathogen detection uh, and real-time pathogen detection by sequencing sewage, by potentially having, you know, potentially doing a lot more, a lot more genome sequencing in a lot more places will give us a lot more information about the next outbreak. And who knows, maybe we could get to a point in public health where we could, you know, catch it before it, you know, before it explodes, um, as it has done so badly for us over the last three years. So, I mean, or two years, I guess. Um, yeah, so there's obviously huge, huge potential um, for, 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 for genome sequencing in, 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 in public health. So Istok spotted uh, on your competition slide PacBio. How does PacBio's technology compare? Yeah, I did, there's, again, there's not a lot of time to talk about a lot of very technical things. Um, PacBio sequencing uh, is broadly uh, similar to Nanopore in the sense that it can produce very long reads. Uh, they're generally not as long as Nanopore. Nanopore can produce reads that are millions of bases. PacBio is still limited into the tens of thousands. Um, however, um, there is a PacBio technology that uh, is very exciting that allows us to get long reads that are very, very highly accurate. So I talked about, you know, I talked about the Nanopore reads having more errors. So Nanopore reads typically are 95% accurate. So about one error every 20 bases. And the Illumina reads are about one error every thousand. Well, the new PacBio reads that we can get are similarly about, they can be about 20,000 bases long and have one error every thousand or so bases. So about 20 errors across the whole length. And that's sufficiently accurate that um, you can you start to put together a human genome jigsaw puzzle with very, very few errors. So it's actually a very exciting technology, um, but there are reasons why I personally believe that it will not scale in the way that the nanopore will, um, if I had to bet. Pers totally personal opinion. Don't take. I don't. I don't hold stock at either company. Just to be clear. Here's a here's another question about the competition from Adam. Um, what is the difference between ultra rapid whole genome sequencing and Stanford sequencing method, which takes twelve weeks to complete? Oh right. Well, so. Um, I guess there wasn't time to talk about that either, but the nanopore sequencing, the library preparation steps, and then the sequencing itself can be paralyzed uh, and reduced to just a couple of hours, right? Library prep about an extra hour, three, three four hours. Um, the Illumina sequencing, they can't get it that fast because they're, so with Illumina sequencing, there is this PCR step. We've all heard of PCR because we've all had PCR tests uh, for the last two years, right? So um, there's a PCR step in Illumina sequencing where the DNA is amplified uh, and that just can't go faster than a certain rate. Um, and so you can't get Illumina sequencing down, that, that step of Illumina sequencing down to much less than a day. It is definitely possible to get the Illumina protocols to be much faster than they are. Most of that turnaround, that those eight weeks are because of samples sitting in freezers and you know all of the bureaucracy. But I think, I think that what that work really showed is that if you put your mind to it and you use a novel te technology that's very amenable, you can actually um, shave off all of that fat and get to a point where um, you can make a diagnosis, yeah, in hours. I mean, just to emphasize, you're going, you sequence six billion different bases in that individual and read every single one of them 60 times and then winnow down to maybe across the millions of variants that that patient will have down to maybe five and then figure out which one is causal in seven hours. It's, it's really a kind of a mind boggling thing to do um, to, for the, the algorithms can manage to do it. 
and the people, I should say there were people involved too, um, but yeah. So we have a, a question with regard to diversity from Kevin. By the way, this may be the last question. I'll let, uh, I'll let Mike decide that. Uh, and I also note that SX asks about uh, the copy of how to get a copy of the slides and, and uh, we'll send out information whether that can be done and, and, and where to oh, find that if that. possible. Okay, so we'll, we'll send out information on that. Uh, but Kevin asks, uh, these 350 diverse genomes, would they include Australian natives and tribes from the Amazon who have been undersampled in all previous studies? Right, uh, and that's a really interesting question. Um, and somewhat, uh, I will say somewhat, certainly above my pay grade in the sense that I don't get to decide. Um, you know, as a, again, as a geneticist, a genomics person, I would love to get representation of all human uh, populations. Um, However, uh, the history of, of genetics um, is not great uh, with regards to uh, marginalized populations. In fact, you know, there, there are well-documented uh, terrible things that have happened. And so for that reason, there are communities, uh, say the Aboriginal, uh, Australian Aboriginal community, um, that have a, you know, basically distrust uh, the, you know, the medical establishment and for reason, reasonable reason. And so, um, I don't think that in the initial version of our project, we will have those genomes necessarily publicly released uh, because for us to release that data, we go through a very informed consent process with the people consenting to the, to, to the data uh, in which we are making it very clear that that data will be available for everybody to see you know, in perpetuity for good. And there are good with DNA, there is good and bad, right? There is good and bad to everything. Um, so, we don't, I don't think we will get to that informed consent process for some subpopulations of humans um, uh, in, in, in our initial grant period. I hope over time, well, firstly, I, I do, that doesn't mean I don't think that those populations won't um, do, you know, what the, there won't be sequencing of those populations. I just think that some of that information will be, um, will not be publicly and openly shared um, by the research community for a while. And I hope that we get to a point where trust is established and we can all as, you know, I should also emphasize that humans, vast majority of human variation is not, um, is not recent. Most of it occurred well before the out of Africa divergence. Most, most variation in humans originates to when all human beings were in one big population, well, one, not one, but you know, in Africa, essentially. So the vast majority of variation is actually shared across populations, just, just to be super clear. This is not, we're not, we are much more similar than we are different and our variations are much more spread out than people actually think, right? And traditional definitions of, of, of race and so forth really don't exist genetically. Uh, so just, just putting that out there. But anyway, uh, those populations, I, I do hope that they will eventually participate, but I do think that it's going to take time before, uh, before trust, sufficient trust is established that people are comfortable to do that. And that, again, not my decision, um, but uh, I would like to see it happen. Well, I think, uh, unfortunately, I think we have to stop there. We do still have a few questions in the Q&A box. I, I wish we could get to all of your questions, but uh, thank you everybody for, for submitting your questions. It was a, a, a fantastic discussion. Um, <clears throat> so I think, uh, why don't we finish this off with a big round of applause. You can, you can type your thanks in the Q&A box for Benedict. And um, we wanna thank you, Professor Payton, for sharing your insights with us this evening. Oh, thank you. I'll remind you this talk. Oh, yeah. Um, and I'll just remind everybody, this talk has been recorded. It will be available on the UC Santa Cruz Arts and Lectures YouTube channel uh, within the next few days. And we'll send that link out uh, in our social media posts and uh, thank you email. Um, I do also want to point out that uh, if you would like to support this work of Professor Payton and all of the other researchers he talked about in this uh, discussion, you can do that by supporting uh, the UCSC uh, um, oh, why don't you remind me, Professor Payton, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, yes, the UC Santa Cruz Genomics Institute, which I think there is a yes. uh, link in the chat. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Yes. Yeah, uh, and thank you, Diana, for posting that link. So um, if you'd like to support this work, please make a donation to the Institute. 
And uh, we'd also like to thank the staff of the Alumni Relations and University Events offices who organized this webinar, webinar and helped us with all the logistics. Thank you, Shana, Diana, Paulina, and Kristen. For our next event, we will, be, we will be returning to our routine timing, the second Monday of the month, which will be Monday, April 11th. Appropriately, since it's soon St. Patrick's Day, we'll be learning about Ireland and Irish history. Professor David Brundage will address the Easter Rising in New York, how Ireland's revolution triggered a fight against empire. Dr. Brundage is professor of history at UC Santa Cruz and is currently chair of UCSC's Academic Senate. He has published widely in the areas of US immigration, labor history, and the history of the Irish diaspora. Recently, he authored a book, Irish Na Nationalists in America, the Politics of Exile, uh, about the period from 1798 to 1998. Um, the book was selected as, as a Choice Magazine Outstanding Academic Title of the Year and described by the Irish Times as a major work that challenges us, challenges us to rethink the history of Irish nationalism and its far-flung far supporters and to ponder its present and its future. Dr. Brundage is finishing up a new book tentatively entitled New York Against Empire, Challenging British Colonialism in a Time of War and Revolution, 1910 through 1927. This book investigates New York City as a contact zone that brings together anti-colonial activists from across the globe. And I, I believe that's the history, of, uh, that's the subject of the talk he'll be giving us. Uh, a big alert, starting in five weeks is UCSC Alumni Week. This is a week long celebration of alumni and a chance to reconnect back with campus. It will run in virtual, uh, in a hybrid of virtual and in-person mode finally this year from April 19th to the, to the 24th. And we'll, there will be over 70 events throughout the week. There are many inspirational engaging opportunities for any slug. Here's a smattering of events that are exciting to me. Uh, there'll be a review of drone programs on the campus and drone posts. A behind the scenes visit to Younger, Galoon, uh, Younger Lagoon Preserve uh, and a burn, bird banding station. Um, the Banana Slug Shares event that we'll bring back from last year. This is highlighting five alumni who will be sharing their expertise on a variety of topics. And finally, uh, the, the keynote for the evening uh, on Saturday, an event entitled Cheers to 30 Years. This is a beer and wine reception that this year will be celebrating the 30th anniversary of the founding of the Alumni Association Scholarship Fund. Uh, so please join us uh, that weekend, um, and I'll, I'll see you in person at the Beer and Wine reception. You'll find more about these and dozens other of enticing events at alumniweekend.ucsc.edu. Again, that's alumniweekend.ucsc.edu. On behalf of the UC Santa Cruz Alumni Association, thank you for joining us this evening, and please come back on April 11th at 6.30 p.m. for our next virtual event. Thank you and good night, everybody.